Wonderful. I'm uh, d- delighted that uh, Heidi's invited me back, uh, especially after yesterday. So, <laughs> always good to know that uh, you made a good impression. Now, if you were here yesterday, and I think about 20% of you may have been, there is going to be a little overlap between some of the content of yesterday and this morning. That is of necessity. Most of the people here this morning were not here yesterday, so that would be new information to them. But nevertheless, it'll be presented in a different format, and it's also going to be much more detailed. The first presentation is going to speak directly to the theory of ADHD as an executive disorder. And in doing so, we are going to go deeply into the neuroanatomy of this disorder, because if you understand what we know now about the neuroanatomical basis of this disorder, you can then walk from there into the neuropsychology of the disorder and what we would expect to see if these particular neural networks were somehow delayed or disrupted developmentally. And I think that's going to give us a much better insight into understanding the nature of this disorder and then into its management. So I have a, uh, a tough row to hoe, to borrow an agricultural phrase, and uh, a lot to cover this morning. So I'm going to ask that you keep your hands down. There will be time for questions at the end of this presentation before the coffee break. And then in following the coffee break, I will speak more directly about the major life impairments of adult ADHD and what we recommend people try to do about them. So that's going to be a very clinical and applied discussion. This is going to be more theoretical and neuroanatomical. The last person to hear this speech said it was like sitting in front of a fire hydrant with the valve open as terms of the amount of information that was coming out of it. So hopefully that was a good thing, not a bad thing, but uh, we'll see. I want to begin with the neuroanatomy of the disorder because this has been a rapidly advancing field along with molecular genetics so that we now understand ADHD to be among the top three neurogenetic disorders in psychiatry, contrary to yesterday's Toronto Star, which interviewed a graduate student in medical history who claimed that this is a myth, a social construct. If it's a myth, it's got some very good neuroanatomy behind it. So we have so much research in the neurological basis of ADHD that just a few months ago, Steve Frohn actually conducted a meta-analysis, which requires that there be numerous studies available and that the results of these studies are then combined mathematically into an overarching meta-analysis of the field. And that review concluded that there are five neuroanatomical networks, or structures rather, that appear to be involved in this disorder. What we know is that in at least two-thirds to three-quarters of all ADHD cases, these would be the genetic cases, that these brain regions appear to be somewhat smaller, about 3 to 10 percent on average, smaller than they should be in their development. Now, that is not enough for individuals to be able to use any sort of neuroimaging device for diagnosis. Dan Amen cannot do this, doesn't matter what he says. Cerebral blood flow studies, functional MRI studies, PETs and so forth are of no use diagnostically because the differences we are looking for are so small as to overlap substantially with the variation in brain size in the normal population. Now, brain functioning is a little bit more promising. Here we find that anywhere from 10 to 15 percent to as much as 25 percent less brain activity within these regions. But even there, we have found it difficult to identify neurological measures such as QEEG or functional MRI or PET that might be useful for detecting these altered brain functions. So suffice to say that while there is a clear neurological underpinning to the disorder, it is not so stunning that one could look at each individual scan and say yes or no, this person would have ADHD. The differences are subtle. They are developmental differences, and you have to average together 50 or more scans to be able to pick up the ADHD normal distinction in these studies. So let's understand that while the neuroanatomical basis of ADHD is very well established, that does not mean you can immediately crosswalk into clinical diagnosis and use these devices for diagnostic purposes. Now, the five structures of the brain that are implicated in this disorder are interconnected, so it's not as if they're independent. If one is smaller, we would expect to see that across the entire network would be smaller as well. And we're going to take a closer look at these structures. The first of them, of course, is the frontal cortex. 
but not the entire frontal cortex, which occupies nearly a third of the front part of the human brain, as I'll show you in a moment, but principally the dorsolateral orbital aspect of the frontal cortex, which is just above the eyebrows and transferring over to the lateral or exterior side of the brain. And most research places it more in the right hemisphere than the left hemisphere. So the right orbital frontal cortex seems to be more implicated. Now, that is connected back into a structure known as the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is where the nerve cells from the frontal cortex terminate. And this structure is involved in motor execution and inhibition for the most part. Tourette syndrome originates in this structure, and we see a release of inhibition of obsessive, compulsive, and uh, other ritualistic mannerisms as a result of a disturbance in this structure. Now, the third structure implicated is the cerebellum. And we know that the basal ganglia projects further back into the central part of this very, very old brain. The cerebellum has been around for millions of years through various other species that were our ancestors. It's a very primitive structure that has to do with the timing and the grace and the timeliness of our motor movements. But we also know that in humans it is extraordinarily important for higher cognitive activity, for thinking, because it plays as much role in the timing and grace and transition and sequencing of our thoughts as it does in our actions. So the cerebellum is not just a principally motor organ. It is involved in thinking as well. But as I'll show you, there's a good reason for that, because at some point we will discuss how thinking is simply private action, private behavior that is being retained in the brain rather than released into the spinal cord. But more on that later. Now, the third structure, which has only more recently been implicated, and which, while not necessarily smaller, is dramatically less active in people with ADHD, particularly adults, is the anterior cingulate. And I'll show you where that's located. It's right on the midline between the two hemispheres, somewhat deep inside the frontal cortex. And we'll have a diagram of that for you in just a moment. The anterior cingulate can be split into two regions, and we'll talk about both of those and what they do, because it will help us better understand the symptoms that ADHD uh, is producing. And then finally, sort of a throwaway region in the brain, if you will, is the corpus callosum. This is the part of the brain in which the two hemispheres project to each other so that they can communicate with each other. And it's principally the front part of the corpus callosum. But that's not surprising because if the frontal cortex is smaller, there are fewer projections to send into the other hemisphere, and therefore the corpus callosum would be smaller as well. So there's nothing exciting about that. Now, we have been able to show that the size of this network is directly related to the severity of a person's ADHD. So this is not hypothetical. We know this is the network. We know this is the ADHD part of the brain. Uh, and we know that when this part of the brain functions normally, it is the part that basically allows us to stop and think before we act. So it involves both the stopping and the thinking that is going to be going on before an act is finally chosen to be enacted. So it's the, if you will, self-regulatory part of the brain. Now, there are some gender differences, particularly during adolescence, in these brain structures, but they are relatively trivial for our purposes. We see these both in men and women, and uh, I don't want to gloss over them too much, but for the purposes of our lecture this morning, we need not go into these relatively trivial differences. Serial developmental neuroimaging studies have shown that this network remains smaller into late adolescence but then begins to normalize in brain size by young adulthood. But because the structure is normalizing does not mean that the function of these areas is also normalizing. It isn't. So we have to be careful here that because some research is finding eventually that brain size appears to be approaching normal, it doesn't mean that what those areas are doing have achieved normalcy in their function as well. But it's about a two to three year lag in brain growth that is identified in these regions. Now, we have to, I think, take a moment and distinguish the fact that 
at least a third of ADHD, particularly in males, is not of the genetic variety. It is acquired. And this set of ADHD individuals, the acquired ADHD cases, may be somewhat different from the genetic cases. At the moment, our research is not so overwhelming that we can make extraordinary, numerous, and definitive statements. But let me just give you a few of the things that we have found so far that distinguish these two groups. The acquired group appears to be more severe. <clears throat> and we find that with all acquired injuries, acquired aphasia is much more severe than developmental language disorders tend to be. It may be that the acquired group is much less responsive to medications for ADHD, the difference being about 70 to 90 percent of genetic ADHD is drug sensitive, but 50 percent or less of acquired ADHD is so. But this makes sense. In the developmental case, the area of the brain where the medication can work is not damaged, destroyed, or scarred. There is a place for drugs to function. But in the acquired cases, they may well be damage, lesions, scarring, <clears throat> which will interfere with the capacity of the drug to act in that region, and therefore would predict that there would be markedly lower drug responding. Now, it may also be, besides this difference in drug response, that there may be differences in response to psychosocial treatments. No one has examined this. But if we look elsewhere in neuropsychology, for instance, as I've mentioned, the field of the aphasias that are acquired, say, from a stroke versus developmental language disorders, if we look at that particular disorder, the language disorders, we find that the acquired group is much more responsive to rehabilitation, particularly if it occurs in the months following the injury. <clears throat> Whereas the likelihood of developmental language disorders showing, showing such a marked response to intervention is quite low. Indeed, the success of language interventions for developmental language disorder is rather sporadic and nowhere near as convincing as is language therapy for the acquired language disorders. People treat them as if they were synonymous. They're not. So that doesn't mean that developmental language disorders don't respond at all to linguistic interventions, to speech interventions. They do, but they don't respond anywhere near as dramatically as the acquired cases. Now, we don't know whether this extends into adult ADHD or child ADHD. But we do know that in other areas where we compare acquired versus developmental disorders, we do see differences in treatment responses in them. There may be differences in life course. We don't know that yet. <clears throat> other differences as well, such as in impairment. But suffice to say, in the future, researchers will begin to distinguish the type of ADHD based on its etiology. The genetic, non-genetic distinction appears to be a crude one, but perhaps a useful one at the moment. Now, we do know that these are not the result of taking stimulant medication, that this underdevelopment and this marked underactivity is not, contrary to Scientology claims, is not a result of giving medication to children. When these first neuroimaging studies appeared, critics in the media were quick to point out that they could just as easily be due to giving medication to children and that stimulants shrank the brain and therefore, we had caused these problems. Fortunately, researchers went back and repeated all of these studies with people who had never taken stimulant medication and found exactly the same results. So we can dismiss, once again, the Scientologist claims about ADHD. 